how does a big factory with a punch? What's the newest rage among interior decorators? Why doesn't this machine sink into the snow? Industry on Parade, a brand new look at our America, produced on film each week by the National Association of Manufacturers. A railroad yard full of iron horses that have made their last runs. The day of the steam locomotive is now all but past. And these rugged old coal burners will soon be broken up for scrap as their places are taken by the more powerful, less expensively operated diesels. Everyone recognizes the reasons for the changeover, but to old timers who have spent their lives in steam, watching familiar old 9500 standing there waiting for the acetylene torch is a bitter pill indeed. Now they'll have to adapt to the diesels, which won't be as hard as it seems. Whole companies like Paxton Mitchell Company of Omaha have had to make a similar transition, and for a big, long-established company, that can be even more difficult than it is for an individual. Paxton Mitchell used to be a major supplier of certain parts for steam locomotives. When it saw the handwriting on the wall, it organized an aggressive engineering department to find new products to which it could turn its experience and facilities. And did they come up with the ideas? Parts for diesel engines, of course, but also a lot of other railroad equipment and products as far afield from railroading as refrigerator parts and manhole covers. 250 employees who might have been out job hunting if the firm hadn't adapted so quickly and well turn to each new addition to the company's line with all the enthusiasm of a winning high school football team. One such addition, a coupling for air conditioning, refrigeration, and other gas lines that link up railroad cars. It has an automatic cutoff to prevent loss of pressure when disconnected. Here's another a system for detecting a dangerously worn engine bearing before it gives way and wrecks the engine. And here's the model of a door that opens automatically at the touch of a finger, remains open a few seconds, and then closes by itself. You can imagine what this will mean on passenger trains and a lot of other places. If you're far-sighted enough to welcome it, progress can't fail to do anything but bring you a world of good. With America's population growing at the rate of two and a half million persons every year, census experts tell us we'll have a population of 200 to 220 million by 1975. With such an increase, businessmen know they are going to be called upon to create 22 million new jobs between now and 1975, when we can expect a working population totaling 88 million men and women. To create these jobs means billions of dollars must be invested in plant, tools, and equipment to produce everything Americans need or desire. A young lady in the office of her ophthalmologist being tested for a new pair of glasses. First, her eyes are checked to determine what her vision is with her old glasses, and after that, the glasses will be removed to determine loss of vision. This is an experience millions of persons undergo every couple of years, for comparatively few of us have anything approaching 2020 vision. We said the girl was being tested for a new pair of glasses, but actually she's getting ready to throw her specs away and wear contact lenses, which fit right on the eyes themselves. With a trial lens in place, any astigmatism or malformation of the cornea is eliminated and it becomes possible to determine what vision she can obtain from contact lenses and to prepare the proper prescription. Although the trial contact lenses make no optical correction, the mere fact that they neutralize irregularity in the cornea often means drastically better sight immediately. 
test lenses that do make optical correction now are slipped into the frames until maximum vision has been attained. The next step will be to custom mold the contact lenses she will wear. This process begins with the mixing of a paste-like substance called moldite, with which impressions of the eyes will be taken. This may sound unpleasant, but it's really quite painless. When the moldite gels in a matter of just a few moments, it has approximately the texture of a hard-boiled egg. Out it comes, easy as anything. From this concave mold, a convex positive casting is made and sent here to Obrig Laboratories in New York City for the preparation of the lens. The lens will be made not of glass, but of an unbreakable plastic, an optically clear form of lucite, a small square of which is softened by heat before being forced down over the dental stone casting that is an exact replica of the young lady's eye. Excess lucite is cut away and the rough lens must be allowed to harden before finishing can begin. In working on the lens, grinders and polishers must know which side will be up and which side next to the nose, so a horizontal line is scribed on the rough. The inside of the lens will be ground first. Since the inner surface is an exact duplicate of the eye, you may wonder why any grinding is necessary. The answer is that the contact lens contacts only the white of the eye. It must not press against the cornea, so a tiny space is ground out to let the lens clear that portion of the eye. Needless to say, dimensions in work like this are measured in thousandths of an inch. Now on a lathe, the outer surface is ground in accordance with the prescription. Since this outer surface is a segment of a perfect sphere, the prescription can be followed with mechanical accuracy. Not all wearers of contact lenses use them for appearance's sake. Many turn to them for comfort or convenience, and others in special occupations like sports or jet aviation use them for safety. But their biggest advantage, of course, is that they do something ordinary glasses can't do, that is, correct deformity in the eye itself. And now the lens is brought to a high polish and is ready to be sent on to the ophthalmologist for fitting. In most cases, it will be returned to the factory one or more times for minute corrections until finally it accomplishes the impossible, improving on nature itself. Cattail rushes being harvested in southern Florida. Now why in the world would anyone want to harvest those? Well, you yourself might have bought some of the reeds from these gentlemen and at a very fancy price. Or perhaps your home is decorated with fronds from the coconut palm or the cabbage palmetto or the other unusual trees tapped for decorator materials by the Miami firm of Vic Roth Weavers. Back at the little plant in Miami, imaginative minds are kept busy devising new, colorful ways of weaving the various natural wood products into fabrics for lampshades, draperies, curtains, screens, and the like. In weaving materials like these, the stained or painted wood strips run horizontally, while brightly colored yarns run vertically. The work goes very slowly. Even setting up a loom for a new pattern is no small task. And after it's all ready to go, the most that can be turned out in an eight hour period, about 35 lineal feet of fabric. Patterns are created by the spacing of the wood, the arrangement of the yarn, and the coloring of both. This big loom makes fabric 10 feet wide. Each wood must be set in place individually. And on this loom, the job requires two men. You can see why the product is so expensive when compared to conventional fabrics turned out on power looms that weave hundreds of yards an hour. 
they use not only Florida woods, but woods common and rare from all over the world. Next time you see someone rummaging among the bulrushes, don't laugh. He may be furnishing your own home. All Americans have benefited under our system of free competitive enterprise. Our way of life in this country is built on individual freedom and individual opportunity. Opportunity, as we know it, means freedom of choice. Here we can choose our own religion, our own occupation, and our own political party. We can decide whether or not we want to work for somebody or start a business for ourselves. This is the reason the American standard of living has gone up and up. The reason it always goes up. Because of opportunity. The freedom of choice. Tromping through 10 feet of soft snow in the mountains of Oregon, is a strange looking vehicle called a snow cat. A pedestrian would sink to his armpits, but the snow cat breezes along at 15 miles an hour or more. It's a product of the Tucker Snow Cat Corporation at Medford, Oregon, in the heart of the deep snow country. Here we see in production one of a number of the vehicles recently ordered for a forthcoming French expedition to the Antarctic. The light aluminum body rests on four pontoons each of which helps drive the snowcat by means of grouser links mounted on an endless track. With the pontoons in place, the track can be installed. It rolls on heavy duty ball bearings and is held in place by a flanged rail. Links of the track are open so they cannot clog with ice or snow. The pontoons are snow tight. Everything about the machine was designed to make the worst winter weather its natural element. Now the ends of the track are joined, making a continuous loop. The Snowcat is a descendant of a machine devised years ago by the company's founder for the very utilitarian purpose of getting him five miles over impassable roads to school. Now vastly improved, the vehicle is finding even more important functions in the service of power and telephone companies, lumbermen, the military, winter resorts, and others. The machine doesn't ride on its tracks, rather it slides along on the smooth undersurface of its pontoons as the links of the four tracks dig into the compressed snow and push it forward. Thus, in even the deepest, softest snow, it sinks in only about a foot. And with all the weight down low, it can go up or down 70 degree inclines without toppling. When highways and trails are buried under many feet of snow, there's nothing like a machine that can make its own roads. Thank you.